Good morning. I'm Dan Filler. I'm the dean of the Drexel University Klein School of Law, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the Klein Institute of Trial Advocacy. Um, as you've noticed, it's a beautiful facility, and we don't know of another law school that has a freestanding trial advocacy training facility in the country. We're incredibly excited to welcome you here. You may know that the Klein School of Law has a deep commitment to trial advocacy. We've won two national championships this year, and before this year, we'd already won two national championships in the couple years before. And it's a passion that runs throughout our program, with our programming and classes, with our scholarships, specifically for people who have excelled as collegiate mock trial competitors. We've been very fortunate to be partnered with Professor Justin Bernstein. And today I have what I would call bittersweet news for us, which is that Professor Bernstein is actually going to be moving to join the faculty of UCLA Law School next year. It's bittersweet news for us because, of course, we appreciated and loved having him here, an inspiration for this incredible competition. But it's wonderful news because what you'll start seeing next year is the joint Drexel Klein UCLA competition. <laughs> We're serious about wanting to make sure that the top trial advocacy competitors understand that Drexel Klein and now UCLA are serious about trial advocacy. And it's incredible competition. But our alumni are going out and using those skills and winning, and winning big verdicts. And it's incredibly satisfying to see what all of you are developing now and how all of that will pay off for years to come. So it's a big deal, and for me personally, it's incredibly exciting because I think we're the only school with a freestanding trial advocacy building, but we're one of the few schools where the dean was a trial lawyer. I know what it's like. It's not applause worthy, it's just what's true. I know what it's like to stand in front of a jury. I know what it's like to work with facts. I know what it's like to tell a story, to convince a fact finder. I know how powerful it is. I know how transformative it is personally. I know that our justice system relies on it. All of you are here for personal reasons. Your skills are building up individually. And I hope you ultimately find your way to law school. And we hope you find your way to this law school. Because when you bring those skills, and when you bring that power to the law, all of you become the beams that hold up our democracy. So what you're doing today is big, and what you will do is bigger. And I hope that you make the decision to grow and be that person with us one day. But for now, I am so excited to congratulate all of you for being here and being the most talented in the country. And I'm incredibly excited to introduce Professor Justin Bernstein. Thank you, Dean Filler. Uh, I'm gonna give a full introduction of our Dean in, in a few minutes when he's a final round panelist. But for now, I think his most important credential for all of you is that he is the person who, when I asked him about this competition, said yes. So let's give him a round of applause. When I asked him about the tournament, he said yes. I did not tell him that the trophy would be a sword because I wanted to get a yes. I want to start by thanking the people that made this event possible. Uh, in addition to Dean Filler, the, the person who runs this building, who made sure that it was transformed into a competition center this weekend, 
who took care of all the catering, all the everything, was Dean Mary McGovern. She's fantastic. She's not here this weekend, but she made this event possible. I want to thank our judges. Do we have anybody who judged this weekend in the room right now? If so, would you please stand up? We averaged 6.1 judges per trial and never fewer than five. And we had tremendous turnout, not only from the Philadelphia bar, but this drew interest from around the country, from New York, from the South, from the Midwest. Um, one of my former students from California. Uh, we are tremendously blessed not only to have so many judges, but so many good judges this weekend. I want to thank everyone here at the Klein School of Law who pitched in, uh, who set up the water bottles, who helped us with the ballots, who escorted judges to their courtrooms. Uh, we couldn't have done it without all of your help. And they're not in the room right now, but hopefully they'll, they're watching the live feed upstairs. I want to thank two of my students in particular. Uh, they're the same two students who represented Drexel at Top Gun a few weeks ago, uh, Phil Pascarello and Jessica Falkenstein. Let's give them a round of applause. I want to thank everybody who posed uh, as models for our, for our trial. If they could stand up, Frankfurt Johnson. Is Frankfurt in here? Frankfurt is, he's alive. And my brother was the pool boy. Ari, would you stand up? Yeah. They love the same woman. Uh, and I, I want to thank the, the two volunteers who helped us a ton this weekend, uh, who came in from, from across the country to make this happen, from North Carolina, Sue Johnson. Sue, are you in here? <laughs> Sue assigned all of our judges this weekend, and running tabulation with me, uh, next year's uh, AMTA tournament director, Melissa Shewitt. Let's give her a round of applause. have awards for our top five competitors, but first I want to recognize uh, one competitor who was the top scoring witness in the tournament. This is not a, a student did not place in the top five overall, uh, but was the top scoring witness at the entire event, which is made all the more remarkable by the fact that this person not only faced good opponents like all of you did, but faced two All-American witnesses head to head and beat them by enough that this person is the number one witness at trial by combat. So I'd ask to please stand and receive a round of applause. Danielle Kunkel. <laughs> Danny finished sixth at the tournament for Miami University. She will console herself by knowing that she was the national champion this year and defeated all of you just a month ago. Yeah. All right, so we have awards for our top five. Uh, Dean Filler, would you mind coming up and handing these to our, our competitors? And you're welcome to come up and take a photo uh, when you receive your award. We have the boxes to place them in afterwards if you want to grab those after the award ceremony. So let's see which one is the fifth. All right, so this is five going down to second. Okay, great. All right, so in fifth place, and there were no tiebreakers. There's actually a, a, a comfortable margin between each of the, the top six, so we didn't have to go to any tiebreakers. Uh, in fifth place... From Georgia Tech, Sarah Stebbins. in fourth place in the world, from Rutgers, Mike Kleinman. In third place, from Stanford, Jack Siegenthaler. Okay. 
So at this point, I'm going to have to ask our dean to step out because he's judging the final round. He doesn't get to know where, where everybody's from beforehand. So dean, we'll see you in a few minutes. Um, I'm going to introduce our final round witnesses. Uh, we're really fortunate, uh, and you'll find that I was not coy with the witness names. Representing and playing Pat Pascarello is the top gun, the top law student in the United States from 2018, Philip Pascarello. Phil, would you come on out? I think you know who Brett Wallace might be. Come on out. Ben is a two-time AMTA All-American. He is the 2016 Top Gun from Yale and one of only two people ever to appear in two Top Gun final rounds. Uh, but you will notice, they, they will, of course won't be sitting at a council table, their attorneys will. But we've got two chairs at the defense table. Ms. Woodward, would you come out please? This is, this is Elisa DiPietro. She is a nationally competitive uh, student here on our trial team at Drexel, and we're delighted to have her as the, fi for the final round. Uh, she has decided that she will be testifying. So before I announce the, the two finalists, I'll tell you how it's gonna work. We have, uh, for each side, the pretrial order, which has three new additions. It says that everything else remains in effect, except to the extent that it's clarified here. One, the defendant's elected to testify. Two, Exhibit 15, of which you have 10 copies beneath it, is an authentic and accurate transcript of the defendant's interview with the police on January 2nd, 1998. And three, both parties have 35 minutes and can allocate that time however they wish in trial. Okay? Uh, the witness statement from the defendant is one page front and back. And at the conclusion of the opening ceremony, you will have, excuse me, the closing ceremony, you will have 30 minutes to do your preparation. You can allocate that time however you'd like. So you can start by talking to your coach, but once you stop talking to your coach and you begin any witness prep, you may no longer talk to your coach before the round. Okay, so we'll, we'll check the time so that we make sure everybody knows what time they're allowed to do their, their prep, okay. Also during the final round, we're going to be displaying the exhibits on the screen behind me. Jessica Falkenstein, who was our Second chair at Top Gun, very comfortable with the tech. It's going to be running that. So you're welcome to use that. We've instructed the judges that you have that op option if you'd like. So you can say, Jess, can we get exhibit two up on the screen? Can we zoom in on a face? She can do all that. Um, she's got all of the exhibits, including the new exhibit 15, loaded into her trial pad. She's ready to go. Any questions about the format? Good. Okay. In second place, in the preliminary rounds, uh, this student was a full, more than a full half check mark per ballot better than the next uh, competitor, representing New York University, Nicholas Ramos. <laughs> Is that okay? mm -hmm. Well, we don't know which trophy to give him yet, uh, but I do know that in a, in a couple hours, I'm going to get to say that the trophy is headed to New York because our other final round competitor from Columbia University is Rachel Summers. don't have a coin toss. Our rules say that the student with the top score through four rounds makes the choice. And here, I'm going to give Rachel a shout out. She was a full two check marks per ballot better than anyone here. So she's, she gets to choose. She gets to choose her side. Rachel? Defense. 
Right. At, it is 11, we're going to call 11.50 now. So on your clocks at 12.20, you must be completed with any witness prep. Any questions? Where can we receive the documents? <laughs> Other questions? Coaches first. What's that? The witnesses know the case. They are the, they are the people. Yeah. yeah. Got one more. Go ahead. 35 minutes you can allocate however you like among opening, cross, closing, etc. Yeah. One more. Yeah. Do I have to cross Ben Wallace? You sure do. <laughs> Good luck, guys. If you want your ballots, if you want your ballots, shh, one sec, at 12 o'clock in the vault room, you can find Melissa Shewitt to review your ballots. I hope everybody will stick around for the final. Thanks, guys.
Should we turn it off for now? I'm nervous, I'm not gonna be able to remember. Um not Oh, geez. Oh, it's on. Hello. Hi. Wait, can you mute it? Like he's, yeah. Can you mute it now or no? Thanks.
to you in the opposite. So I, I wouldn't, but if you can do it, I would absolutely do it. Oh, I'm on. Can we hear me? How much does this pick up? Oh, so we're projected through the courtroom. So we're projected through the courtroom. Yes, but even more than that, your mic's the live stream. Huh? Your mic's in the courtroom, but even more than the live stream. Okay. Okay, thank you. So is it, is this good? The way it's positioned? I can't hear like anything. You sound good. You're gonna be sound good. Can I like Testing. test get how loud it would be? I think, I think, yes. One, two, three, testing, and ready to go. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Justin Bernstein, and on behalf of the Thomas R. Klein School of Law at Drexel University, welcome to our inaugural final round at Trial by Combat. We have, after a brutal field of 16 students, all on 24 hours prep, we have our final two to compete for not only bragging rights, not only the title of best in the world, but a full-size sword. <laughs> I want to introduce our judging panel. Once I do that, I'll step outside and I'll give the competitors a chance to catch their breath. Uh, when you hear a knock on the door, that's, that means we're ready to go. We could not be more excited about the final round panel that have come and flown and traveled to get to this tournament. I'm so excited to introduce them. I'm going to ask you, uh, you to stand when I, when I call you out, and I, I am going to embarrass you a little bit. Uh, I'll start in the back with Michael Polovich. Michael is an attorney, a litigator at the world-renowned Morgan Lewis Law Firm. Before that, he was an attorney general or assistant attorney general in the, in the state of Tennessee. Uh, he has a very storied mock trial background. He was an All-American competitor for Rhodes College, and he coached two top ten teams at Vanderbilt undergrad. Let's give him a round of applause. Brandon Harper. Brandon is a litigator at the global law firm of Melvin A. Myers in New York City. He is also a former judicial clerk, federal clerk. Uh, Brandon is a uh, member of our AMTA board of directors. He is a double All-American. He's one as both an attorney and a witness, and he's watching this round thinking, if only this were around a few years ago, I'd have a sword. <laughs> Let's give Brandon a round of applause. I'm excited to introduce uh, Chris DeBarina Sarobe. Chris is an assistant United States attorney uh, in Delaware. Uh, he is, it's, this is an esteemed panel, but I think he is the most educated because he went to the number one public school called UC Berkeley. Yeah. Go Bears, right. Uh, Chris uh, was a competitor on the 2004 team from UC Berkeley. Uh, that is the last team to finish undefeated and not advance to the championship round. They were 8-0. Uh, so, if somebody is experiencing heartache today, know that you don't know real heartache in mock trial. Uh, we're really excited that Chris came to judge the final. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> Abby Heller uh, has tried over 100 cases as a public defender. She's also a coach here at Drexel's Law School. Abby has coached two different teams from Drexel to national championships, and we are delighted that she's joining our final round. I should also mention that Abby's a graduate of this law school. Uh, moving to our front row, we have Christian Acevedo. Captain Acevedo is a member of the uh, JAG Attorney's Office. He's a trial lawyer, uh, and he obviously represents the government in the United States Air Force. He's also my former student at UC Irvine and a Nationals competitor. Let's give him a round of applause. I'm so excited to introduce Professor Gwen Stern, the person who founded the program here, the trial program at uh, Drexel's Law School. Uh, before she was a professor and the director of our program, Gwen was a trial lawyer herself, a very successful uh, trial lawyer in Philadelphia at one of the top med mal firms in the city. Uh, Gwen's also the recipient of the Philadelphia Bar Association's Sean F. Peretta Innovative Service Award for doing her community service. Uh, she's helped this program become what it is She's wonderful. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> Joining us from Washington, D.C. is Angela Minor. Angela is the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Director of Forensics at Howard University, a member of, not excuse me, she is the head coach 
of the mock trial team at Howard, which is a former national champion. She's also a practicing lawyer in Washington, D.C. Give her a round of applause. Uh, I'm going to save our, our dean for last. Melissa Shewitt is an attorney in Ohio. Uh, Melissa was a fourth place competitor on the Iowa team uh, when she was a college competitor. She's also coached three different schools to the Ampton National Championship. And as Melissa frequently reminds me, nobody else has done that. Uh, uh, Melissa is also about to be the national tournament director for the American Mock Trail Association. Please welcome Melissa. And juror number nine, so we have an odd number. I will not have a ballot in this round. Juror number nine is Dean Daniel Filler. Uh, Dean Filler is a graduate of NYU's law school where he was the editor of the Law Review. He won the Martin Oral, Argument, the Oral Advocacy Competition at NYU Law. Uh, he worked at uh, the global law firm Devavoice Plimpton. He then became a public defender in New York, the Bronx Defenders, and later a public defender here in Philadelphia before becoming a professor at Alabama, one of the founding faculty here at Drexel, and now the dean of our law school. Please welcome him. Good luck to both competitors. We'll start in about 60 seconds. of United States versus Ellen Woodward. Can I get appearances, please, from the government? Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon. My name is Nicholas Ramos, and I represent the United States of America. From the defense? Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon. My name is Rachel Summers, and I'm here on behalf of the defendant, Ms. Ellen Woodward. Great. Is there any housekeeping we need to take up? Uh, yes, Your Honor. I'd just like to bring out a couple of things uh, to your attention, specifically having to do with the pretrial order. Is that okay? Please. So specifically, pretrial order 11. It says that exhibits 3, 11, and 13, which are forensic reports and autopsies, have been pre-admitted. Specifically today, we're going to be calling a witness to the stand, a detective. And it also says that Pat Pascarello, the name of the detective, is familiar with the forensic reports I just mentioned and can testify to their contents without objection. Thank you for bringing this well-drafted special instruction to the court's attention. No problem, Your Honor. What else? Also, Your Honor, we ask permission to use uh, a photograph of the deceased, Exhibit 1, during opening statements. We'll be introducing this in our very first witness. Any objection from the defense? No objection. Uh, while we're there, is there anything the defense wishes to display during opening statement? No, Your Honor. All right, that's granted. And, Your Honor, we just like your preference to know uh, to approach the witness, counsel, move about the courtroom, uh, general, things like that. You need permission if you want to approach the bench, the jury, or an adverse witness. You do not need permission to make free use of the courtroom, to approach your own witnesses, or to approach each other. And finally, Your Honor, may we assume all objection arguments are heard outside the earshot of the jury, con constructively, of course. Yes. With that, Your Honor, we're ready to go. Great. Ms. Summers? Yes, at this time, we just move to invoke Rule 615 for the constructive sequestration of all witnesses in this case, barring, of course, party representatives, and Ms. Woodward will be here for her trial today. Okay, great. Uh, so do you want that to be constructive or actual? Constructive, Your Honor. All right, so those gentlemen get to stay here. That's correct. All right. Anything else? No, Your Honor, ready for trial. Great. Opening? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor? Ms. Summers, members of the jury, 
May it please the court. An 8,000 square feet mansion, two swimming pools, a tennis court, a bowling alley, a home theater, a private gym. Members of the jury, that is what this defendant stood to lose. You'll learn today that on Christmas Day, she had an argument with her husband. And by New Year's Day, he was dead. This is James Woodward, an entrepreneur, a self-made multimillionaire, someone who donated countless money to multiple charities, and a father. You're going to learn today that on January 1st, 1998, as he slept in his own bed, in his own home, he was shot through the head. The person who pulled the trigger, his wife, the defendant. Ms. Ellen Woodward. And you're also going to learn today that she stood to gain millions of dollars from doing this because members of the jury, she had 71 million reasons to pull that trigger. Now, of course, you might be asking yourself, well, if this happened way back in 1998, then why are we here 20 years later talking about this? You see, the science caught up to the defendant. And the thing is that technology that didn't exist back then, but exists now, have allowed us to look at the evidence in a new way. You're gonna to learn today about a shell casing that was found at the scene that's consistent with the bullet lodged in the victim's brain. And that matches the fingerprint of one person and one person only, this defendant. See, that's why we charged her with first degree murder. Now, as the government, we have the burden of proof. We have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she intentionally killed her husband, and members of the jury, we're going to do exactly that because she had 71 million reasons to want him dead. Now, today you're going to hear about the forensic evidence and all sorts of physical evidence from Commissioner Pat Pascarello, who back in 1998 was the lead detective in the case. And he's going to tell you about the defendant's means, her motive, and the inconsistencies in the story that she told him that night. Now, I want you to listen closely as Detective Pascarello points out that the time of death was 12.30. But the defendant willingly told them that there was a burglar who came into the house and shot her husband at around 2, and she was only able to call the police at 2.30. Keep in mind, members of the jury, that you're going to learn today she had two hours alone with that scene. And she tried to make it look like a burglar. Now, that's not the only thing you're going to hear about, because he's going to tell you about that shell that I spoke to you about just a moment ago. And you're going to learn that out of every single fingerprint collected at that scene from everybody who'd been around that home, the only fingerprint that matched on that shell was this defendant. But why? Why would she want to kill her own husband? Members of the jury, today you're going to learn that there was a lot of money involved. See, we're going to show you both a prenuptial agreement, signed by both of them, and a will. And these two documents will paint a pretty clear picture. You're going to learn that in case of divorce, she would get nothing. Their property was entirely separate. But in case her husband died, she would inherit his entire estate valued at 71 million dollars. And members of the jury, you're going to learn that four days before Mr. Woodward was shot through the head, they had an argument. He accused her of infidelity, and he threatened divorce. After that, his fate was sealed. She decided to take matters into her own hands. She had 71 million reasons to pull that trigger. That's why, members of the jury, at the end of this trial, I'm going to come before you again, and I'm going to ask you that you deliver the verdict that's going to be consistent with the facts. Find her guilty, because she had 71 million reasons to want him dead. Thank you for your time and attention.
Defense? Yes, Your Honor. May it please the court, opposing counsel, members of the jury. Close enough isn't good enough. There is no question that the image the prosecution just presented to you, the image of a man, gunshot wound in his head, left to die in his own home, there is no question that that image is as dramatic as it is tragic. No one here would disagree that on New Year's Day of 1998, an almost unspeakable horror befell Mr. Woodward and the right person should be held accountable. But there's a trap, a trap that we as human beings fall into when tragedy strikes. It's the urgent need to find a reason, a source, someone to blame for our shock and our grief and our pain. That reaction is a natural human reaction, but it's not a reliable one. And it's one that we must consciously work to overcome in order to answer the critical question, who is to blame? Now, over the course of this trial, you'll hear that the Lower Marion Police Department fell into that trap, that when tasked with determining who killed Mr. Woodward, a wealthy, well-known honor, they looked to Ellen Woodward, his wife, his third wife, much younger wife, and they thought, she looks close enough. But close enough isn't good enough. Now you members of the jury, you're not gonna fall into that trap. That's because where some people might stop at that first image, Mr. Woodward, you're gonna see a second, Ellen. A woman who watched as her husband was shot to death right in front of her eyes, inches from where she lay next to him in bed. A woman who hoped the police would catch her husband's killer and found herself on trial instead. Members of the jury, this is Ellen Woodward. Even though she has a constitutional right not to testify, she's gonna take that witness stand today because she has nothing to hide. And she's gonna tell you exactly what happened that night. I'm just going to tell you that in the early hours, New Year's Day, 1998, as she and her husband were sleeping upstairs in their bed, a burglar broke into their home. You'll hear that that burglar stole thousands of dollars worth of jewelry and cash and demanded that her husband open the family safe. When he refused, Mr. Woodward was shot in the head. And on the burglar's way out, before the police arrived, he snatched the family's gun to make sure that Miss Woodward couldn't retaliate, couldn't respond. Now, the prosecution's gonna ask you to believe that there was no such burglar and that all of the forensic evidence in this case points to one person and one person only, Miss Woodward, but that's why you're gonna hear from a second defense witness. It's Mr. Brett Wallace. He's gonna walk through the forensic evidence that the prosecution gathered for this case, and we expect that his testimony is going to shed some serious doubt, cast serious doubt on the reliability and the credibility of that evidence. Now, just a few moments ago, each one of you took an oath that throughout this trial and throughout your deliberations, you will presume that Ellen is innocent. I want you to think for a second about that gut feeling we've all felt when the person we know best, your mom, your sister, your best friend, is accused of doing something wrong. Her? No, it can't be. There has to be a mistake. That is the presumption of innocence. And in this case, Miss Woodward is entitled to your presumption that she did not kill her husband. And that presumption will, it doesn't give way unless the prosecution meets every element of its burden beyond a reasonable doubt. The highest standard in the American legal system. There is a reason why we hold the state 
to such a high standard so that we do not make the horrible mistake of convicting an innocent woman. Because close enough is not good enough. By the end of this trial, the prosecution will not be able to meet that burden. And that's why I'm going to ask you to find Miss Woodward not guilty. Thank you for your time. Thank you, counsel. May we call our first witness, Your Honor? Yes. The government calls Pat Pascarello to the stand. All witnesses are sworn. Mr. Pascarello, please come forward. May I proceed? Yes. And Your Honor, just to clarify, because we didn't find out, does the witness have all exhibits up there with him? May I proceed now? Yes. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Could you please introduce yourself to the members of the jury? Sure. Uh, my name is Pat Pascarello. And I should probably spell that. It's P A S Q U A R E L L O. Sir, are you employed? Uh, yes, sir. What do you do? Uh, I'm a deputy commissioner here for the Philadelphia PD. How were you involved in this case? I was the lead investigator in the, the murder of James Woodward. And did you make an arrest in that case? Yes, sir. Who did you arrest for the murder of James Woodward? We arrested the defendant, Ellen Woodward. Uh, do you see the defendant in the courtroom today? Yes, sir. Could you please identify her by something she's wearing, an article of clothing? Sure. Uh, she's sitting right there at the end of that table in the, the black dress and the necklace. Sir, when was this murder? This was back in uh, January of 1998. So, if this happened way back in 1998, then why are we here 20 years later talking about it? Well, science. We found a, a fingerprint, new evidence, that linked the defendant uh, to Mr. Woodward's murder. All right, sir, before we delve into your investigation, I want to start way back in 1998, okay? Okay. How'd you get involved? So, January 1st, 1998, uh, I was on duty on patrol that night, and I received a call from dispatch that there was a homicide in Ardmore, Pennsylvania. Did you drive there? I did. Oh, can you describe to the members of the jury what the premises look like? Sure. 8,000 square foot mansion, tennis court, bowling alley, two swimming pools, home theater, fully equipped. So what happened when you got to the door? When I got to the door, uh, the defendant was standing outside. Did she take you anywhere? Yes, sir. She, she let me in the house. And what happened when you got in the house? When I got in the house, I, I proceeded to the bedroom where the defendant told me uh, the decedent was, uh, was at. Can you describe the shape of the victim for the members of the jury? Uh, can you uh, clarify what you mean by that? Uh, sure, sir. How did he appear to you? Uh, the decedent, uh, James Woodward, was, was lying in bed, covers pulled over his shoulders, and a bullet hole right here in his head. Sir, would you recognize a photograph of the victim if you saw it in court today? You'd have to show it to me, but I think I would. Uh, can you please flip to exhibit one? Absolutely. And just tell me where you're there, when you're there, sir. I'm there. All right, sir, is that Mr. James Woodward? Yes, sir. Your Honor, I ask that this be moved into evidence as exhibit one. What? So, let me do the math. All right, sir. So I want to talk about your investigation, all right? All right. Did you speak to the defendant about what happened in that room? Yes, sir. What'd she say? The defendant told me that that evening, uh, New Year's Eve, her husband went to bed around 10. She stayed up to watch the ball drop, went to sleep around 12, 10 that evening. Uh, a few minutes later, a little after midnight, or, or excuse me, a little after 2 a.m., uh, she said uh, she saw a light come on in the room. Uh, a burglar entered, or who she perceived to be a burglar, wearing a ski mask and some gloves, uh, asked Mr. Woodward to open the safe in her bedroom, and Mr. Woodward refused, and so the burglar shot Mr. Woodward in the head. Was the defendant able to tell you the height of the burglar? Yes, sir. What was that? She said the, def uh, the burglar, rather, was six foot three. Sir, over the course of your investigation, did you find any evidence to doubt her story? Yes, sir. Three things. 
Uh, what were those three things? The gloves that we found, uh, the fingerprint that I told you about a few minutes ago, and the third thing is there was sort of a time problem with the defendant's story. All right, so I want to break down each and every one of those things one at a time, okay? Sure. Uh, let's start with the time inconsistency. What time was the time of death? So according to the autopsy that, that I actually oversaw, uh, the time of death was a little after midnight, around 12.30 that evening. What time did the defendant tell you the burglar came in the room and shot Mr. Woodward? Well, the autopsy said that Mr. Woodward died around 12.30, but get this. The defendant said that Mr. Woodward was shot after 2. So, sir, that would mean that the defendant was left alone, alone with the scene for how long? Uh, two and a half hours. And the defendant told me that the only two people that were in the room when, the, when Mr. Woodward passed away were Mr. Woodward himself and the defendant. Sir, you also mentioned that you found a pair of gloves that made you doubt the defendant's story, right? That's correct. Uh, can you explain to the members of the jury why that pair of gloves made you doubt her story? Well, originally, the defendant told us that the shooter was wearing gloves at the time the shot was discharged. Pursuing to our investigation, we found a pair of gloves in a local park about 100 feet from the residence that were woman small. Sir, what brand were those gloves? Uh, those were Ferragamo gloves, fairly expensive as, as far as I know. Did you ever show those gloves to the defendant? I did. Did she confirm that those gloves, women small, were her size? Yes, sir. Did you test those gloves for any sort of evidence? Yes, sir. Were you able to find anything? We were. What did you find? We were able to find a gunshot residue on those gloves called GSR in, in law enforcement. Now, can you explain to the members of the jury just what GSR is? Sure. Anytime a gun is discharged, uh, particles are, are released from that gun. And what happens a lot of the time, at least, is those particles remain on the surfaces within five feet of where the gun is discharged. We were able to find uh, some of those particles on the glove itself, which would indicate that that gun was discharged uh, within five feet of the glove itself. Was there any other item, any other place in your entire investigation that had gunshot residue aside from those gloves? Not that I recall. All right, sir, so let's talk about that third thing you mentioned, and that was the shell casing. Sure. Would you recognize the shell casing if I showed it to you in court? Again, you'd have to show it to me, but I think I would. Uh, Your Honor, I'm approaching the witness, and uh, may I approach opposing counsel with the shell casing? You don't need permission to approach each other. Yes, Your Honor. Here you go, sir. Thank you. Sir, what did I just hand you? Uh, this is the shell casing that we recovered uh, from the mansion that evening. Your Honor, I ask that Exhibit 10 be moved into evidence. Without objection. And Ms. Falkenstein, again, can we get Exhibit 10 up there? Thank you. So, sir, you said you recovered this back in 1998. That's correct. Were you able to find anything at that time on it? At that time, we weren't able to find a usable fingerprint on this particular shell casing, no. Did anything change? Yes, sir, something changed uh, very much. Uh, what happened? Uh, due to some developments in, in, in the science of, of ballistics and fingerprint testing, we were able to recover a fingerprint uh, from this shell case. And sir, according to the forensic reports, who did that fingerprint match? The defendant. Was it a match for anyone else, any other suspect he had in the case? No, sir. Sir, does that shell casing in Exhibit 10, is that the same, did that come from the bullet that killed Mr. Woodward? Uh, we believe so. The, the gun that, that, that uh, was, or the, rather the bullet, and that was found in Mr. Woodward's head that we recovered based on the autopsy, uh, matches the shell casing that we recovered from the scene. Yes, sir. All right, so, so I'd like to move uh, from the physical evidence and talk about other parts of your investigation, okay? Sure. Uh, did you ever ask the defendant about her marriage? Yes, sir. Did you ever ask her if she had a prenuptial agreement? Yes, sir. Did you ever ask her if she knew about any wills or any other legal documents? Yes, sir. And what did she say? Uh, sh she confirmed uh, that she uh, knew about those two documents that, that I just mentioned, the will and the prenuptial agreement, not when I asked her. Your Honor, is it possible to approach the witness with the will and the prenuptial agreement? I'm, I'm not sure what you're asking me. Oh, he, he, uh, he I, I apologize, Your Honor. I forgot he had them up there for a second. Okay. All right, so, so can you please flip to Exhibit 6? Sure. I'm there. 
So what is that? Uh, this is the prenuptial agreement uh, that the defendant told me about, the one between her and her husband, Mr. Woodward. And can you please flip to seven? Sure. I'm there. What is that? Uh, this is Mr. Woodward's will, the one I asked the defendant about that night. Now, did he ask the defendant if she was present for the signing of both of those documents? Yes, sir. Your Honor, I ask that six and seven be moved into evidence. Pursuant, pursuant to the stipulations that they are authentic, we have no objection. So you're, you have no objection to either document? That's correct. Okay. Six and seven are in. Ms. Falkenstein, can we get six up there? And actually, can we uh, zoom in on B and C? Sir, can you read that out loud for the members of the jury? Sure, so starting with subsection B, uh, in the event of divorce, all assets owned by prospective wife before marrying prospective husband shall remain the property of prospective wife. Subsection C, in the event of divorce, neither spouse shall be entitled to any spousal, spousal support, share of the other's pension, savings, or income, or any increases in value of the other's separate property. And can you please flip to seven, the will? Sure, I'm there. Ms. Falkenstein, can we do the same? Can we go to seven? Thank you. And can we zoom in on that first point in requests and requests? Bequests and requests, I'm sorry. Can you read that for the members of the jury? You want me to start at the first bullet point? Yes, sir. It says, I give, devise, and bequeath all of the remaining and residual property I have ownership in at the time of my death, whether real property, personal property, or both, of whatever kind and wherever situated to Ellen Woodward absolutely and entirely. Sir, did you ever conduct an investigation into how much Mr. Woodward's property was worth? Yes, sir. What'd you find out? Mr. Woodward's estate at that time, the time of his death, was worth $71 million. Sir, did you ever ask the defendant if they had been having marital issues? Yes, sir. What'd you find out? Well, uh, I found out from the defendant that her and her husband had having some problems in the, the month leading up to Mr. Woodward's death, so much so that Mr. Woodward had suspected she was having an affair and even hinted at divorce in the days leading up to Mr. Section Woodward's death. Section lack of foundation speculation as to how he knows what Ms. Woodward suspected. Response, Your Honor? Go ahead. I, I believe uh, that Detective Pasquarello said he's interviewed Ms. Woodward in the past. He's describing events from his interview about what she told him, that he told her he was going to, he was uh, threatening divorce and that he accused her of infidelity. Yes, Your Honor. The witness began testifying to the statements that he heard from Ms. Woodward in that conversation, but for her to, him to go further and talk about what she would have been thinking, not referencing any direct statements she made about what she was thinking, requires him to go into her mind and speculate as to what she was thinking. Mr. Ramos, can you clarify with this witness which portions of that answer were based on what he was directly told by the defendant and which portions were his surmise? Uh, sure, Your Honor. So from what I remember from the answer... Well, we I, I don't, I'm not asking for a response. Yeah. I'm saying can you lay that foundation and clarify with testimony? Oh, sure, I can. Go ahead. Sir, can you tell the members of the jury specifically what she told you about those arguments she was having sure. with her husband? So she told me that her husband actually suspected, uh, or told her that she suspected, that he suspected she was having an affair. And she told me that in the days leading up to uh, Mr. Woodward's death, he actually hinted to her that he wanted a divorce. All right, with that, we Thank renew you our objection to speculation that he hasn't been able to elicit a specific statement as to what she was thinking, and that's still on the record. Okay, so to the, to the extent that you've heard uh, this witness's conjecture or beliefs uh, about what the defendant was thinking you should ignore that we're going to strike that from the record but all the testimony about what he was told from the defendant will remain on the record is that uh, satisfactory yes your honor. government Great. that's satisfactory with us your honor proceed so sir I, I just want to make this clear for the members of the jury you're saying the defendant told you that he suspected infidelity that's correct and uh, around what time were they having these fights the last fight uh, where that conversation was had, according to the defendant at least, uh, was Christmas, a little under a week before his death. Thank you for your time, sir. Uh, no further questions, Your Honor. Would you like to cross-examine? Yes, Your Honor.
Deputy Commissioner, I want to pick up right where we left off with sure. your conversation with Ms. Woodward. Sure. Now, when you talked to Ms. Woodward, that was on January 1st in the morning, right? Yes, ma'am. And at that time, what she told you was she had no fear that her husband was going to divorce her, correct? Objection, Your Honor, hearsay. Your Honor, this is for uh, in impeachment purposes for them to have previously testified that this was his impression after hearing this, that he thought she was worried about divorce. And now that that actually was the opposite of what was told uh, to him, it goes to credibility. Response, Your Honor? Go ahead. Uh, so, Your Honor, he actually struck from the record anything about his impressions. The only thing that was left on the record was her saying he threatened to divorce me and he accused me of infidelity. Now they're trying to elicit other statements by the defendant, which they're not allowed to do since it only goes one way. So, Your Honor, that is hearsay. Uh, Your Honor, we'd still say that uh, his impression and what he believed to his credibility when speaking to her is uh, still relevant and it's not per se for that reason. One more response, Your Honor? Last one. Your Honor, there is no credibility exception to the rule of hearsay. She said at the beginning that it was for impeachment testimony, but there has been no contradiction, direct or otherwise. Objections overruled. When you first arrived at the scene, you spoke to Ms. Woodward, right? Uh, well, uh, the, the, length, the bulk of our conversation took place Later in the evening, when I first got there, she was fairly hysterical, so I wasn't able to get much from her at that point. So I'm, I'm just talking about when you did first arrive at the scene. So sure. you arrive at the scene. Right. Right. You get to the front door, right? That's correct. And you see Miss Woodward on the other side of that door, right? Yes, ma'am. And at that moment, she seemed hysterical, right? She, she seemed very upset. That's correct. She was emotional to, to you, it seemed? That was my perception, at least. That's true. It seemed to you that she'd actually just genuinely experienced a very traumatic event, right? Uh, I wouldn't say it was genuine, but she at least appeared uh, that she had experienced some kind of traumatic event. Uh, I certainly wouldn't say it was a genuine emotion on her part. Well, regardless, you saw that she was crying, right? That's correct. She was screaming, right? Yes, ma'am. And that continued, as you said, into your interview with her that happened later, right? Yes, ma'am. At that time, she was still hysterical, right? Uh, a, a little bit less. I was able to actually get some, some statements from her, but still somewhat so. And it's correct. your testimony that she was hysterical when you were conducting that interview with her. Uh, absolutely, ma'am. That's true. And when you were conducting that interview with her, she talked to you about the events that happened that night, right? She, she told me her version of what happened that evening. That's correct. And what she told you was that after everything that had happened, she was upset because she never thought that her husband would ever think of divorcing her, right? Uh, that's correct. She said that things had improved in their relationship. She said that there were some issues, but that things had gotten better as of recently. Yes. But what she told you during that conversation was there was no thought in her mind that her husband would ever divorce her, correct? Well, that's what she said. That's true. Okay. Now, you'd agree with me, Deputy Commissioner, that it's unusual for a state police officer to testify in a federal murder case, right? Uh, that's correct. Once the, the FBI got involved, there were some federal jurisdictional issues that frankly go above my pay grade. But since I was the uh, investigating officer at the time, uh, I stayed heavily involved. That's true. Okay, so directing you back to my question, it is unusual for a state cop at the time when you were involved in this case to testify in a federal murder trial, correct? It depends. Is it your testimony that it, it isn't unusual? Uh, it, most times, uh, when the FBI takes control, the FBI investigator is the one that's actually doing the investigation that testifies at trial. So in that respect, it is. But when there's federal jurisdictional questions, it's obviously not unusual. So in 1998, when the FBI took jurisdiction over this case, there were obviously FBI investigators then working on that case, correct? Uh, that would be my, my understanding, yes. You, you talk to us about um, some information you learned from an autopsy, right? Uh, I actually oversaw the autopsy. Autopsy, so yes. But you're not a doctor, right? No, ma'am. You didn't conduct that autopsy. I just oversaw it. That's true. Okay, and you talked to us also about some forensic evidence that was found over the course of the investigation, but you're not an expert in forensic science, right? Uh, I'm not an expert. I do have a fairly lengthy training in forensics, ballistics, interrogation, evidence collection, that sort of thing, but I'm not the one that actually takes the evidence back to the lab, conducts the tests, and deals with the actual scientific right, So aspects. there were other forensic technicians that actually performed those tests, right? Uh, Again, I was the one overseeing the investigation, but they were the ones actually performing the test. That's so that's true. a yes to my question. There were other in, uh, forensic technicians that were performing those tests, right? That's true. But you're the one testifying on the stand today, correct? Correct. I was the one that oversaw those, those tests and procedures. That's true. Okay. So I want to talk about one of those documents, the autopsy, for a second. Okay. Okay. 
So uh, you didn't conduct it as you just told us, but you have some working idea of how an autopsy works, right? Yes, ma'am. And so to determine the time of death, you know that you need three pieces of information, right? Uh, you'd have to be more specific. Okay, well, we'll go through them one by one. The first piece of information that you need is the temperature of the body at the time that this examination is being conducted, right? Again, I'm the person who actually oversees the autopsy, so I'm not entirely sure, but that's there's certainly something that uh, the physicians take into account when they conduct autopsies. That's true. Well, detective, you testified that you're familiar with this autopsy, right? Correct. Okay, so, and the basic science and other things that go into investigations like this at a basic level, right? Correct. So that's all I want to go through today. And so you're aware that that's one piece of information that's needed, right? That's one piece of information that's, that's considered. I, I'm not entirely sure how essential it is, whether it's indicative of, uh, of, of cause of death or anything like that. I know it's considered. And that's kind of it. I'm not asking you to testify about whether or not it is or is not essential. I just want to talk about pieces of information that someone would need to determine the time of death. And one of those, as we just agreed, is the temperature of a body when that test is being conducted. I know they consider it. I don't know if it's needed. Okay, well, there's two other pieces of information that they consider. Right? Cons consider, I I'm not sure as to how that plays out with the science. Uh, Deputy Commissioner, you have uh, the autopsy in front of you, Exhibit 3, right? I think I do, if you'll give me a second. It's already entered into evidence. So as we're talking about these pieces of information that would help you to refresh your memory about how this works, the portion there, feel free, free, feel free to look at that section. I'm there. Okay, so we've already agreed you need the body temperature at the time when the examination is being conducted. Uh, it says the, the body temperature is one of the things they did. I, again, I don't know how essential it was okay. in this particular Another process. piece of information that you input when you're determining when a body was no longer living is uh, the average body temperature of just a healthy person. Um, I, I would assume so. Okay, and then as you can see there on the report, the third number that you need is an approximation of how long it takes heat to leave that body, right? Again, that's listed here. I, I don't know whether that's essential. It, it is listed in this autopsy, that's correct. Okay, and you can see from that autopsy that that number is approximate, right? Approximately 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit each hour. That, that's what it says at least. We use these estimations uh, to try to figure out how long it's been since a body died, right? Uh, that's what this autopsy indicates. I, I'm not entirely sure. We don't always know for sure all these data points, so we have to make estimations based on what a healthy person's body would be like, right? Again, I assume that that's why that's in this report. I, I don't really know the science. Okay, well, let's just go through it the best that we can sure. together. Now, you can see from that autopsy, you don't have to do any inferences on your own that, uh, well, Mr. Woodward was not a man in perfect health, right? That's correct. Right. His coronary arteries uh, had significant blockages, right? Yes, ma'am. He had uh, oculant thrombus as well, correct? I don't know what that is, but it doesn't sound very good. <laughs> he had fluid in his lungs at the time that he died, right? Uh, that's what this report indicates. We're that's talking true. about a man who was almost 70 years old, right? He was 68 at the time of death, that's true. And you know, what you can see there is that the data points that were inputted into the formula to work backwards and figure out the time of death well, those were 98.6 degrees for an average person, an approximation for how long body heat takes to leave a body, and then the one point they did know, the only point they did know, which was his body heat at the time that they were conducting the examination. Correct? Uh, can you restate the question? I'm confused about the question. So what we can see here is, despite knowing all of that, despite knowing that he wasn't a man in perfect health, the variables that were put into a formula to determine how long it had been since he had died were the average body heat for a normal person, an average for the rate that heat leaves a body, and then the one variable that they did know, the only variable that they did know, which was what the heat of his body was when it was right there in front of them. Again, I, I don't know that those are the only variables. Those are certainly listed in this report. Okay, Deputy Commissioner, I want to talk about maybe some piece of physical evidence that you are more familiar with. Sure. So you talked to us about a shell casing on direct examination. Uh, yes. Right. And uh, to be clear, you never recovered the weapon that fired the bullet that produced that shell casing, right? No, ma'am. You don't know where that weapon is? No, ma'am. You actually don't even know what make or model that weapon might be, right? Uh, no, ma'am. All we can say is that uh, Mr. Woodward owned a Ruger SR-22 and that it was missing. But what you do know is that when you fire a gun 
like he told us on direct examination, a particle of these gunshot residue, uh, these gunshot residue particles, they, they come out of the gun, right? Yes, ma'am. And they adhere to surfaces that are close by, yes, correct? Yes, ma'am. Now, when the forensic examiners were conducting their investigation of this case, they didn't find any gunshot residue on Mr. Woodward's body, did they? Just on those women's small gloves, that's it. They didn't find any gunshot residue on Ms. Woodward's hands, right? Uh, like I said, the only surface that there was any GSR were those women's small gloves that we recovered. That's so it. there wasn't any gunshot residue on her arms? That's what I just said. On her chest? Again, that's correct. On her legs? That's right. Anywhere on her body, right? Yes, ma'am. You didn't find a single particle of gunshot residue anywhere else in the entire home, correct? Just on those gloves, that's true. Now, you keep talking about these gloves, but you didn't find any of Miss Woodward's fingerprints on those gloves, right? Uh, just on the shell casing uh, that was near the bed, that's it. Right. Talking about the shell casing, talking about the gloves, and you didn't find her fingerprints on those gloves, right? No, ma'am. You didn't find her DNA in those gloves, right? No, ma'am. You didn't see that her name was inscribed or something inside of the gloves? No, right? ma'am. What you did was you went to a park and you just found a pair of women's gloves, and that's what you knew about them. Yeah. Women's small gloves uh, that we learned were the same size as the defendant, that's true. No further questions. Redirect, Your Honor. Go ahead. Sir, uh, when Ms. Summers got up here, she asked you a lot of questions about the autopsy and about the time of death, so I want to follow up on some of that, okay? Sure. How many crimes have you worked on? Uh, in Objection, Your Honor, relevance? Your Honor, do you want me to, would you like me to explain? Yes. Uh, so, Your Honor, opposing counsel made an issue that he might have had a fever, his body temperature might have been higher, he wasn't a particularly healthy man. I'm trying to establish foundation that he's worked on a lot of crimes, he's seen a lot of autopsies done, and if there was a fever or something that would have been noticed, that would have been noted in the autopsy. I'm going to use it with the autopsy, too, to show that nowhere in that report does not mention that he had a fever or anything strange like that. Response? Uh, Your Honor, simply state that we didn't... Uh alleged that his temperature was higher or lower. Um, but if he wants to elicit testimony about there not being a fever on that, we have no objection to that, Your Honor. Okay. It's overruled. So, sir, how many criminal investigations have you been a part of? 30 plus years in the force, hundreds. Have you uh, been to more than one autopsy? Uh, quite a few, unfortunately. And, sir, at those autopsies you've been present at, if someone has a condition that would cause a high body temperature, a fever or something like that, would that be something that you've seen noted? Yes, sir. I've seen uh, that sort of thing noted in autopsy reports many times. And Exhibit 3 in that entire autopsy report, can you flip to it? I'm there. Sir, does it make any mention that Mr. Woodward's body temperature was higher than normal at the time of death, or he had a condition that would make it higher than normal? I, I don't believe so, sir. No. Thank you for your time. No further questions. Brief recross, Your Honor. Go ahead. Deputy Commissioner, you have no evidence to suggest that anyone measured Mr. Woodward's body temperature on December 31st of 1997, right? Other than in my experience, if that sort of thing takes place, it's noted in the autopsy, and it's not here. That's all I can Right, say. so no one measured his body temperature the day before he was killed, right? I don't know. No further questions. Your Honor, may the detective be excused? Yes, thank you very much. And with that, Your Honor, we rest our case in chief. Great. Vince? Yes, Your Honor. May we call our first witness? Yes. Uh, that's Mr. Brett Wallace. And before Mr. Wallace begins his testimony, could I just uh, approach to retrieve Exhibit 10? I'm not sure where it ended up. Sure. Is it up there? Okay. Is that yes, all right, Your Honor? You certainly may. May I proceed? Yes. Could you please introduce yourself, spelling your last name for the record? Hi, good afternoon. My name is ben, uh, Brett Wallace, W-A-L-L-A-C-E. What do you do for a living? Uh, along with my sister, I own a forensic consulting firm, which is Wallace Consulting. Uh, <coughs> primarily, we work on the defense side, so when a state or federal entity brings a criminal prosecution against someone, uh, we're often hired by defense teams to provide the type of forensic analysis that is available to uh, government clients and is too often not available to defendants. What sort of educational background prepared you to get into that line of work? 
So I have a, a bachelor's degree in biology and chemistry from the University of California at Irvine. And I also have a master's degree in forensic science from Irvine too. How long have you been working in the field? Um, since I graduated. Uh, so I spent my first six years out of college working on a CSI unit for the San Diego police. Um, after that, I spent a couple years with the Innocence Project and now own my own firm. So all told, something like 20 years. And how'd you come to be involved in this case? Um, I was contacted and retained by the counsel uh, for Miss Ellen Woodward. Okay, and what were you asked to do? I was asked specifically to take a look at a shell casing that apparently was found at the crime scene. It had been tested years ago and tested in light of new technology recently. I was asked to look at the testing that had been done and offer conclusions as to whether that testing was properly performed and what, if anything, that new testing tells us. Were you paid for your time? I was. Did you come to any conclusions in this case? I did. All right, well, I want to get into those in a few minutes, but first, in coming to those conclusions, did you have sufficient facts and data? Yes. Well, what facts and data were those? I had the shell casing, uh, and I had a report prepared by the FBI investigator who ran the recent forensic testing that I was telling you about. Those two things were all I needed to run the sort of analysis that I run in my line of work. And did you apply reliable principles and methods to those facts and data that you just talked about? Absolutely. What principles or methods were those? Uh, the specific method that was used to do the fingerprint testing, which we'll talk about in a little bit, is called electrostatic fingerprinting. Um, and my methods that I use to review that are the exact methods they teach in forensic science institutes all over the world and that police departments use every day. Okay. Could you tell the members of the jury now a little bit how that process works? Sure. Um, if you've ever seen CSI or any other sort of TV show, you probably know what regular fingerprinting looks like. Uh, a print gets left on a surface, they sprinkle powder on top of it, dust, place tape down, put that tape on a card, and you've got your fingerprint. What the, the, the problem with that sort of method is that it relies on the oils in the fingerprint still being on the surface at the time the printing is done. And there are a variety of ways in which that oil can get removed. It can be rubbed off can be washed off with soap and water. What we found out more recently is, uh, as recently as 2008, is that there are ways to take fingerprints even when the oils have been gone for the surface for years. So how do you do that? So we rely on electromagnetic properties of the substance that we're fingerprinting. So this works best on metal, uh, usually on alloys of brass. Uh, so copper works particularly well, and that's what the shell casing in this case was. The way this works is that when the fingerprint is left, even if the oils have been wiped away, the oils corrode the metal that they're left on, slightly and invisibly, but corrode the metal nonetheless. So what we do is we run electric current through the shell casing, the surface, whatever it is, dust, and the areas that have corroded as a result of the oil do not change color with the fingerprint powder, whereas everything else does change color, leaving a readable fingerprint intact on the surface. So this method that you just explained to us, complicated. Yeah. <laughs> Did you apply it reliably in this case to the facts and data that you had? Uh, I have no reason. I, I didn't actually perform the, the testing myself. Uh, the, the FBI investigator did, but I have no reason to believe that he didn't perform the method sort of reliably. But when you went back and had the shell casing yourself mm -hmm. and applied the same method yeah. to it, did you do that reliably? Yes, Your Honor, counsel is testifying. May I be heard? Sustain. You can rephrase. Did you apply the methods that you just talked about reliably to the facts that you had in this case? I did. Okay. So after all of that, what conclusions, if any, were you able to come to? Um, a couple. There was a print, you know, when we ran the electrostatic testing, there was a print left on the shell casing that had been found at the crime scene. Um, it was a print that the FBI believed had a match to Ellen Woodward, and I feel very uncomfortable with that conclusion. Um, the way fingerprinting works is that we look for points of similarity between exemplar fingerprints that we know belong to a particular person and the print left on a surface. Um, I, I found that this print only had eight points of similarity with Miss Ellen Woodward's fingerprints, and I don't think that any expert should, should be telling you that those few points of similarity are enough to match an exemplar fingerprint to one left on a surface. So to be clear for the members of the jury, is it in your expert opinion, 
Is there sufficient evidence to say that the print found on that shell casing belonged to Miss Woodward? No. Okay. Now, this might sound like a random or goofy question, but uh, Mr. Wallace, have you ever loaded a gun before? Sure. Yeah. So, do you know how to put an individual bullet into the chamber? Sure. Um, I mean, you can either slide one into the chamber or load a magazine, either, either way. So approaching the witness with what's been already entered into evidence in Exhibit 10, and just for demonstrative purposes only, would you mind taking that shell casing and just showing us how you'd pick it up if it was a bullet to put it into a gun? Uh, sure, yeah. So you just take it, uh, slide back, chamber, slide comes forward, and when you push the gun, slide pushes it out. You want to let the record reflect that Mr. Wallace has just picked up Exhibit 10 using his index finger and his thumb. The record reflect uh, the use of both fingers to pick up the bullet. Mr. Wallace, if you were going to load that imaginary bullet into a gun with just your right index finger, could you show us how you do that? Uh, I, I don't think that's possible. I mean, first off, it'd be impossible to, to get the bullet up with just one finger. Uh, <laughs> and then the, the loading process simply wouldn't work. And there, there's no way to put, to, at least I've never seen it done, uh, put a bullet into a chamber with just one finger. Were you able to recover a, a thumbprint then at all from that shell casing? I wasn't. A sole fingerprint on this, and it was the right index finger, if, if any finger of Miss Moody, it was the right index finger that it had eight points of similarity to. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. No further questions at this time. Cross-examination, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Doctor. Good afternoon. I have some questions for you today, okay? Sure. So on direct examination, you testified that specifically the way the FBI tested the evidence was called electrostatic fingerprint testing. Correct. Like you said, it's a relatively new technique. 2008 is when the science first kind of came into being. And it's been in Houston courts since 2013, right? That's correct. Specifically European courts, right? I believe most of the instances in which it's been used have been overseas. That's correct. Now, you would agree that you yourself know of 10 prosecutions that make use of the technique. Absolutely. That's correct. And in every single one of those prosecutions, it's never been overturned, right? Just sure on an improper opinion may be heard. Yes. To ask this witness to testify about what's happened in other cases, whether convictions have been overturned, it's asking him to talk about legal issues. He was called here today to talk about the technical aspects of the fingerprint analysis that he conducted. For him to talk about any legal issues invades, well, frankly, your job as judge, Your Honor, in the province of the jury. A response, Your Honor. Go ahead. So we're not actually asking him to talk about legal issues. What we're doing is we're talking about the reliability of this technique. See, they're trying to cast out that this technique can actually produce things, whether it's a new technique, things like that. I believe those were issues that were brought up in the direct. If this technique has been accepted by the forensic community, has been well established, regardless of the fact that it's been around since 2013, it's important for the members of the jury to understand that this technique has been shown to be reliable. Your Honor, may be heard? Yeah, I, I, yes, and then I have a question for each of you. Go ahead. Uh, There's certainly other ways to establish whether or not this method is reliable. It's error rate, for example, just experts comparing work or peer-reviewed work, things like that. But to go the extra step and say that the method is reliable because it's resulted in convictions that haven't been overturned, that is not the proper foundation to lay because it goes into these legal issues. Understood. My question for the defense is, you're saying that whether or not this has led to any uh, convictions being overturned is irrelevant and potentially misleading. Yes. If there was evidence that this, in its brief tenure as science, had led to convictions being overturned, wouldn't you as, a, as the defense attorney be jumping up and down and telling me how relevant that is? Your Honor, the issue is, regardless of whether or not it's relevant, it's substantially more prejudicial than it is probative. Okay. Uh, Mr. Ramos, you're telling us that the fact that it hasn't led to any convictions being overturned is evidence that it's reliable, but this has only been in use since 2013. Most of the time when there's a wrongful conviction, it takes more than five years to determine that. So isn't this the kind of thing that's going to mislead a jury unfamiliar with the speed of the judicial system? Um, no, Your Honor. The technique has been around since 2008. It's only been in use since 2013. But we believe that a technique that's been around for, let's say, 10 years, there would have been some sign or some sorts of studies, and that's what we're about to delve into, other signs that it might be wrong, that it's something that can lead to wrongful convictions. Okay. I'm going to permit the government to talk about peer review, studies, etc. cetera. Uh, but as for its use in the court system, I agree with the defense that given the brief time in which it's been available, 
evidence about uh, convictions being overturned in other jurisdictions with different rules is uh, problematically misleading, or at least potentially misleading. So I'm going to sustain the objection, and the jury will disregard testimony about how this process has been used in other court systems. May I proceed? You may. So, sir, this is a peer-reviewed technique, right? It is. It's been published in journals? Correct. You yourself have read about it? Of course. And you would agree that this technique is accepted by the Forensic Association as a whole? I'm not sure I would go that far. I mean, it, it definitely is an accepted technique, but as with any method, there are skeptics. Sir, you would agree that, as a whole, the forensics community accepts this technique, am I right? I guess I would say, on the whole, the forensic community accepts it. I, just as a whole, it's not like every member of the forensic community has come to a consensus. Dr. Yet. Wallace, on balance, the forensic yeah. community accepts it, yes or no? That I agree with. All yes. right, sir. Now, you would agree that this technique works particularly well on certain types of surfaces, right? Correct. One of those surfaces is brass. Yes. Now, you are aware, you're aware that Exhibit 10, that shell, is brass. Correct. And you're aware that was in an evidence locker for about 20 years, right? Uh, I, that, yeah, that seems right to me. They did the initial testing years ago, and then... I think it was stored in an evidence locker until the more recent testing. But sir, this technique can pick up fingerprints that have been around for 50 years. Correct. So I'd like to speak more about the results you arrived at. So when you tested it, you arrived at an eight-point match, right? Correct. And that just means that eight individual points around the finger, well, that matched the defendant. Correct. So even you agree that there is a fingerprint on that shell casing, Yes. Even you agree that there are points on that shell casing, on the fingerprint on it, that match the defendant? Absolutely. And when the FBI agent tested it, he arrived at a 12-point match, right? That's what he decided. Uh, sir, that's a four-point discrepancy, right? Huge difference in our field. Sir, that FBI agent, correct me if I'm wrong, he's not being paid by the defendant, is he? No. You are. Correct. You received a $15,000 flat rate. Yes. You received $10,000 to be here in court today and talk to us. That's right. And you did some lab tests, of course. Mm -hmm. And the defendant, she covered all those lab tests. She covered the cost of the lab tests, correct. Now, sir, as you said on direct examination, you own a consulting firm, right? That's right. So on top of that, you're a business owner. Yes. And sir, you've testified in 21 cases for the defendant. Right. You've submitted 20 expert briefs on appeal for the defendant. Right. And your business only does business with defendants. Right, as you just pointed out, the FBI has their own experts who do this thing. I just do it for defendants. Uh, that's right, sir, I understand. But your consulting company only consults for defendants. To this point, yeah, we've only been retained by defendants. So, sir, I'd like to talk about a test that counsel actually didn't bring up on direct examination. Okay. You ran a computer image analysis on that fingerprint, right? I did. That's when you input it in that computer and then it spits out a certain number, right? Right. You'd agree that this test is reliable? Sure. It's accurate? Yes. Also peer-reviewed? Yes. Sir, when you compared that bullet, uh, that shell casing, I apologize, when you compared that fingerprint on the shell casing, to the defendant's fingerprint, you found an 83% probability that they were the same. Correct, an 83% probability that the fingerprint from the shell casing belonged to Miss Ellen Boulder. Uh, sir, let me ask you a question, a hypothetical, okay? If you could play the lottery every single day and have an 83% chance to win, would you do it every day? Yes. That's a pretty high chance to win, right? Depending on how much it costs, but this isn't a lottery, it's a criminal. So that's a pretty high chance to win. Sure. And you know in a criminal trial, that's not the only evidence we may have, we may have right? Understood. Actually, objection on improper opinion. Response, Your Honor? to whether there's other evidence or to the law to? To ask, <laughs> to ask about, <laughs> to ask about whether or not he knows about other evidence and how that might inform his decisions and probability and things like this. May I respond, Your Honor? I, I, I think that if counsel's gonna get into that evidence, there's a lack of foundation here, but just simply saying if the witness aware that there is other evidence, I think is fine. So I'm gonna overrule the objection. Sir, let's talk about something else that you don't disagree with, okay? So you don't disagree that that shell casing 
might have been wiped. Uh, it's, it's certainly possible. It might have been washed. Also potentially possible. And sir, you actually received a number of other fingerprints in this case, right? Uh, yeah, e exemplars from just sort of around the, the Woodward household. So from Mr. Woodward? Yes. From a live-in assistant? Correct. From a pool boy? Yes. And sir, each and every one of those fingerprints had zero percent match with the fingerprint on that shell casing. Right, not a single point of similarity between any of those three people and the fingerprint on the shell casing. So the only fingerprint in this case that matched the shell casing belonged to the defendant. I don't think it matched. I wouldn't say that. The only fingerprint in this case that you were able to match to the defendant with 83% probability was on that shell casing. I agree that there is an 83% similarity between the casing and Ms. Woodward. Thank you for your time, Doctor. No further questions. Ms. Summers? There's no redirect, Your Honor. Just ask that Mr. Wallace be allowed to step down. Thank you much, Doctor. With that, can we call our next witness? Yes. The defense calls Ellen Woodward. May I proceed? You may. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Could you please introduce yourself to the members of the jury, spelling your last name for the record? Sure. My name is Ellen Woodward. That's W-O-O-D-W-A-R-D. Where do you live, Miss Woodward? I'm in the Philadelphia area right now. And what do you do for a living? I am an editor at a fashion magazine. Do you have a family? Any children? No, I'm single. I never remarried. Okay. Now, I want to talk to you about your late husband, if that's all right. Sure. Okay. How did the two of you meet? Well, I was originally from Idaho, and after high school, I graduated and started doing some modeling and fashion work, which brought me to California. And that's where I ended up meeting James. I was working as a caddy at a celebrity golf event, and he was there. What happened after you met? The sparks flew, as these things sometimes happen. So that was um, the summer of 1995, and we were married the next year in July. Can you tell us a little bit about your marriage? It was wonderful. I mean, it, it was love at first sight. I know people tend to raise their eyebrows because at the time I was 26 and he was 65 when we got married, but it is what it is. It was, it was the real thing. Did your marriage ever change over time, the relationship between the two of you? What do you mean? Did you ever argue? I mean, sure. All married couples argue. We had a couple of spats here and there, but nothing too concerning. You've been sitting here throughout this trial, right? Yeah. So you've heard of the evidence about the prenuptial agreement that uh, the two of you signed in his will? Sure, yeah. Miss Woodward, did you ever have any reason to believe that your husband was going to divorce you? No, of course not. I want you to bring you to the night of uh, New Year's Eve, 1998, early morning. Can you walk us through what happened? Sure. <clears throat> So it was New Year's Eve, and we had decided not to go out that evening. He just, you know, wasn't up for it. So we had dinner, and he went to bed around 10 o'clock that night. I decided to stay up to watch the ball drop on the TV, and I went upstairs around 12.10 to go to bed. About 2 a.m., I'd say, I'm sure of the time, I was woken up by a light being switched on in the bedroom. And this woke James up too, and I looked over and there was a man standing there with a ski mask on and holding a gun. Did you recognize that person? No. Could you give us um, some physical descriptions of what they might have looked like? Yeah, um, he was wearing all black and like I said, he had a ski mask on and he had gloves, so I don't know if, what skin color he was or anything like that, but he was about 6'3", I'd say, and he had a really deep, calm voice and um, sounded fairly educated. And I, there was some sort of accent, maybe Philadelphia or New Jersey, but I'm not sure. Well, what happened after you saw this person standing in your bedroom? He came into the bedroom and he came up to the foot of the bed where we were laying. What happened next? Um, he wanted James to 
show him where to open up the safe. He had a safe in his closet and uh, James refused to do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, he refused to do it. And that's when the burglar raised the gun and shot him in the head. What happened next? Uh, you think 20 years would make a difference, but I'm sorry. He told me to show him where we kept our valuables. So um, I got up and I went to my closet first and I got out all the jewelry and cash I could find. I, I think I gave him like $10,000 or something in cash. And then I went into James's closet because it wasn't locked. And he wanted me to open the safe, but I didn't know the combination. So he rummaged through there for a little bit and grabbed some cash and he took James's gun that he had in there. And um, I think that's all he took. What happened after that? So at that point, he told me to sit in the closet for 10 minutes. And if I came out before then, he would kill me. So I, I sat in there and I counted to 500. And then as soon as 10 minutes had passed, I called the police. I woke up Riley, who was downstairs. And then I let the police in when they got here, got there. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Woodward. No further questions at this time. Thank you. Counsel? Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Ms. Woodward. Hello. You said something interesting on direct. I wrote it down. You said, quote, I never had any reason to believe he was going to divorce me. I right? I say that, yeah. You've been in court for the entire time, right? You saw me there. You were here for the testimony of Detective Pat Pascarello. That's correct. You heard him say that on Christmas Day, the two of you had an argument. We did have an argument, but it was just an argument. Uh, you're saying it was just an argument. He accused you of infidelity, Who right? Did? Your husband, he accused you of infidelity. Yes, he did. Infidelity is a reason to divorce you, right? Yes, but it never happened, and I wasn't disloyal. I understand that, that you're saying you weren't disloyal and that it wasn't gonna happen, but you would agree with me that infidelity is, in fact, a reason for divorce? For some people, I would assume. And he did threaten to divorce you? Yes, at the, during that fight, he did. This was Christmas Day? Yeah. He died a few days later, right? I know when my husband died, yes. Ma'am, I want to talk about the will that he left and the prenup you signed, okay? Okay. Ms. Falkenstein, can we get Exhibit 6? You would agree with me that all your assets were separate when you signed the prenup. That is what a prenup is for. Yes. They stayed separate. Yes. You would agree with me that in case of divorce, you would not be entitled to spousal support, Correct. right? Or a pension. Correct. Or savings. Right. Or income. Yes. Can we get exhibit seven? But you'd also agree with me that if he were to die before you, you were, would inherit his entire estate. That's what the will says. And when you spoke to the police, you estimated that estate, you said, must have been around $50 million, right? That's what I said. Today, you know that estate is $71 million. Yes. If he divorced you, you would lose the mansion? Right. If he divorced you, you wouldn't have access to those two swimming pools? That's correct. You divorce you, you'd lose your tennis court. That's correct. You'd lose your home gym. Sure, but again, we never got divorced. I understand, ma'am. killed him, and we weren't planning on getting divorced anyway. I want to talk about some of the evidence that you've heard about throughout the trial. So you said a burglar came into your home and he was 6'3". Yep. Big guy, right? Yeah, 6'3 is pretty tall. Normal build? Mm -hmm. Yes. You heard today that gloves were found outside your home, right? Yes, they were found in the park nearby. Gunshot residue? That's what I was told. They were a women's small, right? Right, but they weren't mine. I understand they weren't yours, but they were in fact a women's small. Yes. And they were Ferragamo. Yeah. That's an expensive brand, right? Yes. And then finally, I want to talk about one more thing. You heard today that a 22 caliber bullet killed your husband. That's what I was told. And you know there's a shell casing, right? 
I was told that there was a shell casing, but I don't know anything about it. I didn't see it. I didn't touch it. I didn't even know it was there. Exactly. When you spoke to the police, you said, I've never seen that shell casing. Right, because I hadn't seen it. I've never touched it. Yeah. You heard today from your own expert that there is an 83% probability that you touched that shell casing, right? Look, I don't know anything about any shell casings. I just know I didn't know about it. I'm not asking what you know. I'm asking what you heard. You heard from your own expert that there is an 83% probability that you touched that shell casing. Yes or no? That's what was said. Thank you for your time. No further questions. There will be no redirect. Just ask that Ms. Wallace be allowed to step down. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Woodward. Woodward. Anything else from the defense? No, Your Honor. The defense rests. We're ready to move to closing arguments, Your Honor. Let's do it. Can we get Exhibit 1 on the screen? Would counsel for both parties like a uh, time check, or do you know how much time remains? I'd like a time check, Your Honor. May I proceed? Yes. Members of the jury, on January 1st, 1998, this man did not expect to die. He did not expect that his own wife would shoot him in the head. He did not expect that she would leave his body cold and upstairs for two hours while she fake ransacked the apartment. And she, and he did not expect that he would be willing to go, she would be willing to go to that length. Members of the jury, she had 71 million reasons to want him dead. Now today we had the burden of proof and we showed to you that she intentionally shot and killed Mr. Woodward beyond a reasonable doubt. And there's three simple reasons why you know this is true. It's the physical evidence, the inconsistencies in her timeline and her motive. So I wanna talk about every single one with you, starting with the physical evidence. See, today we heard about a pair of gloves, but we also heard a story told to you by the defendant of a 6'3", big guy, walking in, shooting her husband. But members of the jury, ask yourselves a question. What kind of 6'3 burglar wears women's small? What kind of 6'3 burglar wears Ferragamo? Now, on top of that, you knew those gloves had gunshot residue on it. And nothing else in the home, nothing else in the area had gunshot residue apart from women's small gloves that you heard today matched the defendant's size. And on top of that, we showed you Exhibit 10. And here's the interesting thing. Both parties agree that this was touched by someone. And their own expert witness, and keep in mind, this was a man who was paid $25,000, had to get on the stand and say, yup, 83% probability of a match to the defendant and only the defendant. And on top of that, I tested other fingerprints and not a single one from any other suspect, any other person who was in the home matches. Now, members of the jury, in just a moment, Ms. Summers is going to get up here, and she's going to tell you, close enough isn't good enough. 83%, well, you're leaving a 20% chance there. But I want you to keep in mind that that is not the only evidence we have. We don't only have the fingerprint. We have the gloves, and we have the inconsistencies in the defendant's story, so I want to talk about those. Because you heard that the time of death was 1230. And Ms. Summers, she tried to say, oh, something got it wrong, the coroner got it wrong. But members of the jury, this is not pseudoscience. This is an autopsy. The coroner would not get this wrong. And you heard from Detective Pascarello that if he had a fever, the victim had a fever, or anything that would change his temperature, that would be noted. And you're going to have a chance to review that autopsy, and you're going to see there's nothing there. Nothing to indicate that his body temperature wouldn't be normal. So we know it is a fact that at 1230, he was dead. And we know it is a fact because of the defendant's own testimony that at 12.30, the only two people in that room were the defendant and her husband. So what does it make sense? Well, you heard today that she called the police at 2.30. Members of the jury, she had two hours to ransack her own home. 
She had two hours to throw clothes around, step outside, try to get rid of a gun, try to throw away some jewelry. And she almost ran out of time, and that's why we have the gloves. Members of the jury, every single time they come up here and they say it was a burglary, it had to happen, you don't have to believe their story. See, because if a story isn't reasonable, it doesn't create reasonable doubt. And right now, they're not offering you reasonable doubt, they're asking you to doubt your reason. So finally, I want to talk to you about the motive in this case. Because what you saw is the defendant had two choices. Exhibit six, a prenup. Exhibit seven, a will. She'd get nothing or she would get everything. And you heard today that on Christmas Day, he threatened a divorce. And a few days later, he was dead. So ask yourselves why. Why did it only take a few days? Why was it so soon? The members of the jury, she had to act fast because he accused her of infidelity. And she stood to gain $71 million. If she didn't do that, that swimming pool would be gone, that private theater would be gone, that bowling alley would be gone, that tennis court would be gone, and she would be left with nothing. So to stay a millionaire, she had to become a murderer. Now, in just a moment, Ms. Summers is going to come up here again, and she's going to try to tell you that this defendant is just the most unlucky person you have ever met. And she was so unlucky that this master criminal, when he went in there, rummaged through the house and shot her husband in the head, left behind no fingerprints, no hair follicles, no fibers, nothing. That she is so unlucky that the only person the fingerprint on the shell casing matches is her. That she is so unlucky that women's gloves size small were found with gunshot residue close to the home and that she is so unlucky that the coroner made a mistake and got the time of death two hours wrong. But members of the jury, it's common sense. Nobody had luck like that. She had 71 million reasons to pull that trigger, and because she went through with it, this man is dead. Find her guilty. Thank you. May I proceed? You may. May it please the court, opposing counsel, members of the jury. Close enough isn't good enough. We heard that on New Year's Day, the early hours, 1998, Ellen Woodward awoke to a nightmare. Standing in the doorway to her bedroom, she saw a man, masked, armed, and he began raiding her room, stealing jewelry, cash, and ultimately demanding that her husband, Mr. Woodward, open up a safe. When Mr. Woodward refused, he was shot in the head. Miss Woodward has relived that nightmare every single day for the past 20 years. And today, as she stands trial for the murder of her husband, a new nightmare begins. Now, I want to be frank. It's easy to look at Mr. Woodward, Miss Woodward, their marriage, their age gap, his wealth, and be reminded of popular tropes that we see in books and movies and on TV. But the job that you've been called here to do today isn't easy. It's really hard because it requires you to put aside any biases or preconceived notions you might have and just look at the facts. And before you do that first part of the job, before you clear your mind, and you take a first glance at the prosecution's case, well, it might look like Miss Woodward is close enough. But close enough isn't good enough. It's not good enough because the prosecution had the burden of proof in this case. They had to prove their burden to you beyond a reasonable doubt, the highest standard in the American legal system. 
So now I want to walk you through some of the evidence that we saw and heard and show you exactly why the prosecution could not meet that burden. Now, they made a really big deal about this shell casing. Mr. Ramos told us in his opening statement that the reason that we're here in trial today is because the prosecution thinks that this is such important evidence, evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. But remember what you heard from Mr. Wallace. Now, as a defense, we didn't have a burden. We didn't have to call a single witness. We didn't have to present you with a single piece of evidence, but we chose to call Mr. Wallace here to talk about the forensic evidence that you heard from the prosecution because, well, frankly, members of the jury, that forensic evidence doesn't always add up. It doesn't always make sense. Remember what he told you when he was sitting right there on the witness stand, that when he ran this same test, it was not a match for Ms. Wallace. That there was at least a 17% chance that it wasn't her, basically one in six. Members of the jury, that's not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And you can't find her guilty. But putting the forensic evidence, that aspect of the shell casing to the side for a second, the way that that shell casing and the bullet that produced it fits in to the prosecution's theory, well, that doesn't make sense either. Think about what they're asking you to believe. They're asking you to believe that while Miss Woodward was planning for her husband's murder, meticulously planning this whole thing out, that she had the forethought to get a pair of gloves, presumably so she wouldn't leave any evidence behind, but then in the critical moment when she was loading the gun with that bullet, suddenly forgot to put on the gloves, didn't have them on, and then once the bullet was in there, well, then she decided to put the gloves back on and shoot her husband. Members of the jury, that just doesn't make any sense. And we know that when you load a bullet into a gun, you can't do it balancing the bullet on your finger. You have to hold it with two fingers. And forensic experts for the past 20 years have been looking at this shell casing, and they haven't found a second fingerprint. They haven't found a thumbprint. And that's important because it shows us that there's evidence there that these experts aren't able to find. Because of that, you have to ask yourselves, what other fingerprint evidence relating to that shell casing aren't they able to see? And what other fingerprints, what other potential suspects could have handled that piece of evidence. This fingerprint evidence that they have is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt, so you can't find her guilty. So what else did the prosecution bring us? Well, we heard about some gloves. We didn't actually see the gloves. We're not sure where they are, why they're not here, if the police had them. We haven't seen these gloves. But we heard that there was a pair of women's small gloves found in a park. Members of the jury, what we've heard that the prosecution didn't find on those gloves was any of her DNA, her fingerprints, her name, anything linking those gloves to her, just a pair of gloves in the park. And he might say, well, how could this be a coincidence about this gunshot residue? We don't have to answer that question. We don't have a burden. But the fact that we don't know for sure where those gloves were, were who they came from, that's a gap in their case. That's a question they're not able to answer. And that's not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So they say, well, there's a reason why there wasn't gunshot residue anywhere else. It's because she had a two-hour window in which to get rid of all the evidence. The members of the jury, if you think about the assumptions that had to be made to get to that two-hour window, it gets smaller and smaller, even disappears. And I tried to ask the deputy commissioner questions about how we calculate these things. He agreed with me that you do have to make some assumptions. And so that window starts to go away. That window, members of the jury, didn't exist. But part of the reason that we're having so much trouble actually determining, well, how does this process actually work? How long could this window be? Is because the prosecution chose not to call the people that would be familiar with the technical details of this case. Recognize members of the jury that in a federal murder case, the prosecution chose to call one witness and one witness only. The state cop who received the call 20 years ago. Not the FBI investigators who took over the case. We heard about some of them not the person that performed the autopsy, just that one person. For him to testify to his own experiences, read over a bunch of materials from his colleagues, that was close enough. And because we weren't able to hear from those people and get into these details, we still have questions. Well, what would happen if he was a sick man, had a higher or lower temperature? What would that do to the gap? We can't answer those questions because the prosecution chose not to call those people. And because they didn't, you're allowed to infer that they thought doing so would hurt their case. When you go back to deliberate members of the jury, I want you to ask yourselves why they didn't want you to hear from those people, why they didn't want you to see the gloves. 
to ask yourselves what the prosecution is hiding from you 20 years later. But we do have an idea of what happened because we heard from Miss Woodward that she watched her husband die inches from her when this armed burglar burst into her home. Members of the jury, you have the power to free Miss Woodward from this nightmare. I urge you to find her not guilty. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Your Honor, I'd just like to know how much time I have for a rebuttal. 41 seconds. May I proceed? Yes. Members of the jury, Ms. Summers just told you that, well, you can't hold a bullet like this, so it couldn't be the defendant, and that's reasonable doubt. But I want you to think back to my cross-examination of the expert witness. When I stood right here and I asked him, sir, was there any evidence that this was washed or wiped? And he said, yes. Members of the jury, she washed it. She wiped it. But the defendant missed a print. When it comes to meeting our burden, we are more than close enough. We're there. She had 71 million reasons to want him dead. Find her guilty. Thank you for your time and attention. Can, uh, can I get our advocates to please stand? Can we give them a round of applause? Uh, can, uh, can I have our witnesses please stand? <laughs> uh, I want to recognize uh, Ms. Falkenstein on the tech. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know it's a good trial when Elizabeth Bayes is timekeeper. In a moment, I'm going to ask uh, our, two, uh, our, our, our two forensic experts to uh, collect the ballots from our jury. We'll give them a moment to complete those. Uh, you're going to get some brief comments from them, and we'll come back in for the announcement of our inaugural champion. So I'll, I'll give our, our judges a moment to complete their ballots. Um, in the meantime, our competitors are, are welcome to relax, catch their breath. You can step outside. We'll be back in a moment. Ooh. Yeah, I'm still mic'd. I'm still mic'd. Turn a mic on. Wait, turn it here.
All right. Um, I thought the two of you were extraordinary. Um, we, are, we have to give you what we thought was the best for each one, um, each one of you. So I think, Rachel, your demonstration with the defense expert of showing how there's no way she could have held that bullet by with one finger was tremendous. I thought that was really believable, and that was my favorite for you. Um, your name is, what's your first name? Nick. Nick. Okay, Nick, um, my favorite for you was when you got the defense expert to admit the 85%. I loved the way you did it. I loved that you really had conviction, and I thought that was very, very believable. 85% is a lot, and I thought that was excellent. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, for the government, I thought your use of the exhibits was seamless. I think this is the first time you guys are using this presentation here. I would have believed that you'd been working with that, um, you know, with, with that technical expert for, for years. It's just right off the cuff. Let's go to the next whatever it was, the will. The, it was just perfect. Um, I also agree that uh, the one finger, two finger bullet holding was, was phenomenal. It came out of nowhere. I had, I, I had no clue that's where you, you were going when you gave him the, the exhibit, but it, it, it was just a wow moment. It just uh, opened my eyes, and I had not seen that perspective before in judging these previous rounds, so I thought that was done phenomenally. Um, yeah, you guys did a great job. This was a lot of fun. Um, congratulations to both of you. Um, Nick, I, I thought that something you did that was really great was not, I, I won't identify any one specific thing. I just think you have a phenomenal demeanor. Um, and that might sound like a cop-out comment, but in a trial like this, where it's literally just you, you're not competing on a team, um, you know, your personality and your presence is what drives the results. It's the reason you're sitting here in the final. Um, so, you know, congratulations on that. I think you just have a, a really comfortable courtroom demeanor. You're really engaging. Um, Rachel, that was one of the best openings I've ever seen in any tournament. You were both exceptional. Nick, I really liked the riff you did, and pointing out that she must have been the person with the world's worst luck. I thought that was well done. And Rachel, I agree with the others who talked about the demonstration with the one finger. So I'll say instead that I thought your best portion of the trial was your rapport with the witnesses that we know you've not been working with. You haven't been working with these people. And you had a really great, it seemed, natural rapport. Um, maybe I'm the only person who didn't love the one finger thing, but... Um... Uh, we can talk about it after if you want to. But uh, Rachel, I thought your opening was phenomenal, and I think your uh, your overall demeanor in terms of how you approach things, incorporating emotion at the right spots, you chose to front things, um, and you did it very well in the right spots, and when you only have 24 hours to work with it and get an opening out like that, um, I thought that was incredible. And on the flip side, Nick, I thought your closing was, was, was top notch. Um, you know, you have a ton of energy. You have to be running out of energy by now, um, and it it doesn't it doesn't show. And um, you know, you carry that through, um, and the, the aggression is just is it, it's it's right at the line. But I think it's it's sort of perfect, and it's very true to you. So I have the same comment for both of you that I thought the best thing that you did was that you have come so far in developing your courtroom persona in at such a young age. I think that takes attorneys years to develop how to be themselves in front of a jury. And we saw two completely different styles of advocates that I felt like I was seeing who you were as a person. Um, and I think that really resonates with juries. So I commend you both on having developed that so genuinely at such a young age. So Nick, I, I'm gonna echo a little bit, but I just thought your energy is really great. And as a coach, that's a really hard thing, I think, to coach, but it makes you very, very engaging no matter what you're doing, and it makes you really easy to watch. And then Rachel, I thought your cross was fantastic. You had a very difficult witness, and witness control is very difficult, and you handled it flawlessly. Um, Nick, I, uh, this is the online thing. I thought your looping around the numbers was uh, both on the edge and also great. No one was leaving here without thinking about 71 and 83 except for Gwen, who thinks it's 85. Um, 
<laughs> um, so I thought that was great. Um, Rachel, I'm just gonna touch one. I, I thought um, I really liked the closing on the missing evidence. That to me is a crucial closing in a case like this. But I also really appreciated touching your client. I think that my experience in actually trying cases, much of the cases tried in the privacy of the two of you. Hi guys, great job. Rachel, I'm gonna begin with your opening statement. I thought that it was just the right energy to make you, wow, well wait a minute. He was good, but so was she. Excellent job with your opening. And I have to say, your closing was phenomenal. Drop the mic type closing. I'm not gonna drop this mic, but it was good. It was excellent. Kudos to both of you, excellent job.